Yes. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome back for our second edition of our sourcing webinars, How to Turn People into Candidates 2.0. And I am very, very happy that Balash joins us today. Um, after he, uh, he also joined us last year. Uh, I do dare to say that last year, Balash was one of our highest rated speakers uh, with the content that he uh, shared then um, in terms of how to become a sourcing expert. Uh, but this year, we're gonna be talking about something completely different, sourcing 4.0, cracking human networks. I asked Balash, Balash, so what can we expect? He's like, just join. You will be in for, for a ride, you will be in for a treat. And knowing Balash and seeing how many times he's presented, I know that uh, we're all going to be in, uh, in for some, uh, some amazing, uh, amazing content uh, in, uh, in that sense. Before I formally introduce uh, Balash, let me first say uh, a couple, couple things what is good to know. Um, please ask all the questions that you have in the chat. I will be moderating. If I see that there are a lot of questions uh, around the same topic, I will interrupt Balash and speak and say, hey, Balash, a couple questions in the chat. Unfortunately, Balash is not able to see the chat, but trust me, um, I will write down all the questions that can wait until the end. And if there's some very important questions to ask throughout the presentation, I'll just get back on the screen and say, hey, Balash, this is what people uh, people want to want 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 to know. And don't be afraid to ask any questions that really keeps uh, keeps the excitement and uh, and also the interaction, uh, interaction uh, going. And um, we'll make the recording available after, so you don't have to constantly take take notes in that sense. But it is advised from uh, from some some of uh, some of the good uh, good stuff. And, and don't feel afraid to connect with each other. Share your LinkedIn profile in the, in the chat, and also share a little bit where you guys are from. It's always good to see uh, where 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 people uh, people are from uh, in uh, in that sense. Um, guys, super happy to introduce Balash. Balash is one I dare to say one of the most well known sourcing trainers. Uh, and also sourcing expertise. He helps companies build out their sourcing functions from scratch, worked many, many, many years in our industry, is a well-known trainer, has his own uh, academy where he trains and helps uh, sourcers across the globe, from starters to very senior uh, senior trainers. Our head of sourcing has uh, recently been trained by uh, by Balash. Um, and yeah, we're, we're therefore super excited to have, to have Balash on, the, on this webinar. Um, Balash, I'll go off screen, the floor is yours and, uh, and good luck. Thank you, thank you so much, and thank you so much for inviting me back uh, this year. Um, it's it's really a pleasure to see all the all the names, you know, in the chat, and I just feel like I, you know, I know at least half of you guys. So I'm a little like, you know, excited whether I will be able to share any new with you. I'm thinking about Sagi and Nofar and Zuzi. So you know, hopefully, some new stuff will 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 come to your way. Um, so let me let me try to share my screen, and hopefully you guys can can see it. Um, Adrian, if you guys have any technical issues, just stop me, and I can you know I can replay my slides. Okay, so sourcing 4.0, aka the human network crackety. <laughs> now crackety uh, is not a word, hopefully, or <laughs> I'm just hoping it's not a bad word. Um, but we will talk about, you know, like a new method of sourcing. So before we jump into sourcing 4.0, I need to talk about what is, oh, oh, I need to talk about myself. I hate to talk about myself. This is me. I have companies become great at sourcing. That's what I do. I train people, I train recruiters, and, and also I, 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 I train head of talent acquisition people and consult with them, work with them, you know, like to build sourcing functions and to, basically to refine their sourcing strategies. Over the last one and a half years, you know, we've been extremely humbled and, and you know, and, and lucky. And I really feel humble, I can tell you, that we've got the chance to work with so many companies around the globe. So if you want to join this group of logos, just let me know. Now, we talk about sourcing today. So. To understand sourcing 4.0, we have to understand sourcing 1.1 and 1.0 and then and then the other. So what do I mean by sourcing 1.0? 1.0 is basically Boolean search. Now, why, why is it important to have a methodological, methodological um, approach? Because you guys, when you source, you have to understand, you know, like the method, you know, that you apply, you have to understand what you actually do, you know, like what is that? So when we say 1.0, that's Boolean search, when we apply certain keywords, why? 
because we assume that people who have those keywords in their profiles, they will be a positive match to our query. You understand me, right? If I type in Java and engineer, I'm hoping that I will get Java engineers. Easy, right? So that's just like 1.0. Now, most of the systems nowadays still only support 1.0 sourcing. Think about LinkedIn, for instance, you know, LinkedIn, um, is primary based on Boolean, right? So Boolean and some filters, and that's what we can do there. Now, sourcing has evolved. And then after a while, we understood that, you know, if I put Java and engineer, I will get some people, but, you know, some other Java engineers may call themselves, you know, Java developer or Java programmer or Java ninja or whatsoever. So that was the moment when, you know, scientists and, you know, technology people started to think about that. Basically, the plain Boolean is just not anymore enough because people are not using, you know, <laughs> you like it or you don't, but people are not using those keywords that we believe they may use, right? People just like cannot read in our minds. And that was the down, that was the birth of semantic search. So semantic search is nothing else than the search engine, you know, has been developed um run the semantics of the language you know those search engines trying to you know trying to to understand how the language works and trying to enrich your keyword with all other related keywords so if you type in engineer they may come up with synonyms for engineer like engineer or developer or coder or programmer but also they may you know suggest you to use keywords like engineer or engineering or development or even GitHub, right? So that's the new, that was, that was, that was a brand new uh, method. Um, I, I still remember when Glenn Cathy, the big Glenn Cathy, the Boolean black bad Glenn Cathy, you know, has first posted something about semantic search and that was back to 2000, I don't know, 2006, seven. Um, and we had, you know, so many um, hot and, you know, and, and, and fireful arguments about, whether a semantic search is the future or not. Now, I call it 2.0, right? That was a big thing in our life. <clears throat> so unfortunately, not so many channels are actually supporting semantic search. Now, when you think about the LinkedIn recruiter, um, you know, like the newest interface, and you may recall that when you start typing in the, you know, the job title, um, you have the chance to to, to add your keywords or to select, you know, from the drop down that LinkedIn recommends you to select from. Now that's semantic search already, actually. Um, so LinkedIn recruiter is supporting semantic search. I'm just correcting myself. Um, regular LinkedIn or LinkedIn premium is still Boolean only. Now, um, another semantic search example is, is Google, right? So if you go to Google and you, let me use my pen, if you go to Google, let's see, you know, this example and you type in pharma, Google will look around and will come up with all of the other variations that are related, you know, from a semantic perspective, related to the term pharma. And Google will look for terms like pharmaceuticals or pharmaceutical industry, or even just the term pharma. Now that's 2.0, okay? We will get there soon <laughs> to, to, to the 4.0. 4 what is 3.0? Now 3.0, that was a brand new, that was, that was really, really exciting in the moment when I think it was Guillaume first, you know, who, who coined, who's coined the term like the behavior-based sourcing. I think it was Guillaume Alexander. At least I think, you know, I heard it from him. Now behavior-based sourcing is, is, is a brand new concept. It's a concept when we say, you know what, like people may not use the keyword that we that we are looking for. Like, you know, like there are so many not rich profiles on, you know, on LinkedIn and on the internet, right? Um, and still, you know, like there are so many developers, you know, who, who would not list all of the technologies that they are familiar with. There are so many whatever professionals, you know, who just don't use, you know, who don't have a CV in place, you know, who hasn't uploaded their CV, um, you know, who hasn't completed a full LinkedIn profile whatsoever. So data keyword search is actually limited. But we can move on and we can say, well, wait, like the way how people behave 
that can reveal something for us, you know, for sourcing. Well, what do I mean by that? Yeah, what you see on the screen, right? If someone belongs to a certain meetup group, that tells something about that person. And what is important at this point, so what you guys need to understand is that every search, every search that you run, every search is built on assumptions. If I type in Java and engineer, that's the same assumption then if I say that people who belong to a Java engineer group, meetup group in Berlin, they will be Java engineers. That's the same way. We build an assumption and we test it and we try to understand if our assumption was correct or not. Okay. Um, again, why I'm like emphasizing this whole thing? Because if, during this show today, we will reach a certain moment when we will actually search without any keyword, like any keyword. And there's a moment when you may feel like, oh, but how are you sure? And my answer will be that I'm not sure. But you know, when I type in Java and engineer, I'm not sure that I will only get Java engineers. Okay, so that's something I think really important. Now, let's see a few examples about behavior search. It's just to give you some, you know, like some context. If you guys have any questions, please use the chat. I don't see the chat because I only see my screen. Um, and I'm trying to talk, you know, like, like look into your eyes and, you know, and, and, and talk straight to my webcam. But if you have questions, please use the chat and Adrian will help us and, you know, he will stop me. Now, back to this, a few examples about behavior-based searches. And again, these are just examples. What you need to, what you need to understand, you know, what you need to learn from, from these slides is, is, you know, is my mindset. Is my mindset is that there are some people who are, you know, who are not searchable, who are not findable, who you will not be able to identify via a keyword because the keyword is just not on your profile. Now, what type of behaviors do we have in scope? First of all, if someone belongs to a certain group, right? If someone belongs to a certain group, chances are extremely high that that person, you know, has something in common with that certain group. So if you think about groups of meetups or Facebook groups, even, you know, including the job seeking groups, right? Or groups like associations or LinkedIn groups. So a group membership, like belonging to a group, tells a story about your professional interest and potentially about your professional background. Now, um, that's one. The other, people like joining a certain professional event. Think about this, this particular webinar that you just joined. Um, <clears throat> so you joined this one. So you probably are not, let me dare to say, you are not a data scientist, are you? You know, you might be a sourcer or recruiter or someone from talent acquisition, probably further, you might be a HR person. Um, God bless you. Um, but, you know, but, but related people would join such a webinar. Now, what I have on the screen is that the LinkedIn event as a thing is, is getting quite popular. So this is what we see that, you know, you can just go to LinkedIn, you know, you put a keyword, you say DevOps and you click on events. And then you will have, you know, like hundreds of results, hundreds of upcoming events. Now, did you know that when you click on attend, so you say you pretend to attend, um, then so when you say I attend, then you will be able to click on these, you know, like attend the list. And even more so, not only you can click on the, 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 the link, but you will see every person, you know, in this search, and actually, because you attend the same event, you will be able to message them for free. Just saying, right? So what I'm showing you now is that this is a DevOps event, which is happening probably in a few days. Um, you can run some other keywords. You know, you can use filters. In this example, I was I was using Germany just as a country just to check. And now voila, I have three DevOps engineers who will be attending that event. Whatever. Again, it's a behavior based sourcing. Let's have a few more examples. Um, being a fan, being liking something, you know, like uh, adoring something, being in love with something, you know, that's also a behavior pattern that can reveal some information about the professional. 
So people, what you see on the, on the left hand side, people who are using the, the hashtag match hair, like this hashtag, will probably be match hair employees, right? Um, <clears throat> so if I, well, not this sport player, whatever, cricket, is it cricket? Um, so not, not this guy, I guess, but you know, if I, if I think about this team picture, well, I know Adrian for sure, but I, I don't know the other people, you know, if I check this picture or if I check this dinner, or if I check this, you know, like happy lady with a cross on, um, these guys most probably are other match employees, right? And I know it because they were using, they were posting a picture on Instagram via using the right hashtag. Again, I, I don't see any keyword that recruiter or sourcer or whatsoever, I'm building my assumption based on the fact that they behave in a certain way on the social media. Or when you think about you know, people who are tagged on a certain picture, again, if you think about this one, like I can tell you, we can we know that all these three people are developers. And how do we know this one? Because you know, we see that they were tagged on a group picture at Ultra Hack, which is like a like a development hackathon, right? So that's the way how how behavior-based search works. Now, let me give you one more example, and then you know you, you will understand. So Another behavior is when we check in at a certain place, right? People who check in at I know, Facebook um, office in Dublin most probably work at, you know, at the Dublin office of, at Facebook. And again, there will be false positives. There will be people who check in in that office because they are so proud that they made it and they are not Facebook employees. That's for sure. But again, think about 1.0. Even you type in Java engineer, you will get false positives. So Glenn Cathy once said that, you know, like you have to acknowledge and, and accept that every search, like every search you run will include po positives, but also false positives. And every search you run, he also said, will exclude positives. Okay, so there is no such a thing like perfect search. I guess that's what he wanted to say. So. If I go to let's say for for a location on Google Maps, and you know, and then I I can check the reviews. I can make assumptions that you know, if you check this review, for instance, that this gentleman most probably is an employee at that certain company. Now that's the behavior-based searches, and hopefully it's getting clear. Um, because if it's clear, then we can make the next jump, <clears throat> and we can go to sourcing 4.0. Now. Sourcing 4.0 is built, in my theory, is built on the fact that people tend to network somehow with like-minded people. So basically we can say that this is a part of behavior search because this is the, the connection, right? It's like how we connect with people. But, but I think it's, it's just a new category. You can search, you can find, um, millions of professionals without without ever using any keyword you know so when we were when we were you know running this search for instance or this search you know we were still using devops right like we, we had a keyword but with this one you know we moved to we, we moved to the the point when we you know when we just use the power of the of the network of, of the people's network. Now, let me show you a few examples and hopefully that will tell the story for you guys. So, oh, sorry. Yes, this is, this is super important. Now, what I'm trying to, to my point today is that, that all of these four search ways or search methods are correct. And none of them will be perfect, like none of them. And yes, LinkedIn is still a, a great channel, but you, but you know, but there are cases when you just like cannot find more people via LinkedIn. You know, you need to make a step, and when you have to make a step, you know, you have to apply other search methods. So Boolean search is great. I love it. I enjoy it. You know, like it's a it's an intellectual challenge. I I, I like it a lot. But Boolean search is not the only way how we can find other potential candidates. We have all these four options. 
But the challenge is that, you know, we are applying various assumptions, you know, in these various four methods. So that's, that's I guess that's where, where I'm trying to, to you know, to, to navigate you guys. Okay, so let's see a few examples for network searches. So first of all, LinkedIn. <clears throat> um, can I ask you please, to, to click on, so to, to visit this link, so it's bit.ly, so bit.ly slash first connection, and, and it's capital C, okay? It's important. So it's bit.ly slash first connection with capital C, and please use the chat and put the number, how many people do you see when you click on this link? Okay, go for it. I will check the chat now. Please use the chat. Thank you. No, with capital C, that's important. So bit.ly first connection, but with capital C. Thank you, Susanna. Thank you. Okay, so 34 for Susanna. Three, six. Twenty-four, seven, three, zero. Wow, 186. <laughs> Thank you. Um, thousand one hundred for sure, uh, and then a zero, and then a one, and a three, and a sixteen hundred. Exactly. That's the whole point. Now, what do you think, guys? Um, I'm still checking your chat. What do you think? Why are we getting various results? Why Dima is getting eleven hundred, and you know someone else is having zero? Why? What? What? What is that? Hello, Patty. Jesus Christ, 5,800. Okay, next question. <laughs> Why are we getting different results? Please answer in the chat. <laughs> okay, so connections, location wise. Right, I don't network with many Ukrainian developers. <laughs> exactly, one connection, I don't have any. Uh huh, cool. Okay, so. <laughs> We get different results because Glenn Gutpacher is not, you know, not working with Ukrainian developers. <laughs> exactly. So that's the whole point. You know, this is a search. This is a search when we, you know, when we set the search to see our first level of connections. Um, now, why this is extremely, I think it's extremely smart. Because I can tell you a, a, a real story. So <clears throat> we used to work for a client. That was one of my RPO companies, and that was this giant co company in the states. Um, my my US friends, you know, will immediately recognize the, the the company. So so this company is is headquartered like globally headquartered in the middle of nowhere. I've been there, and I can tell you that there are three restaurants: one Japanese, like one sushi, one Italian, one Mexican. <clears throat> End of story. Two hotels. <clears throat> You know, one big road, and then you know, like a few <laughs> giant building employing five thousand people. Now, this is actually in the middle of nowhere in the states. I, I think there is no any middle of nowhere whatsoever in the United, the United States. Now, this company is hiring everyone, or trying to hire everyone in this global headquarters. Now, how do you like, like, you know, like, yes, and one more important aspect so whoever whoever was has ever been hireable within that state within the city within that neighborhood within that state within the neighbor states that person has already been hired by this global giant company okay now our job as recruiters is to find others but you know when you when you have like everyone in front of you, you know, you have to find a financial planning analyst, you know, and you can actually target everyone in the US, like everyone that's like what, 300 million people? I mean, you know, it's not written on any people's profile that I want to relocate to Bentonville, right? It's not there. How do you find still this information? How do you define these people? And you know, this link, not the Ukrainian one, but the US one. So this tactic was a tactic that we were using. And we built a search, you know, we put the right keywords there, um, we put the right locations, right? <clears throat> and then we sent this link to our hiring managers and their teams. 
And we said that, hey guys, can you please have a look on your first level network, you know, with this search? And can you think about, you know, like who might be open to relocate to this, you know, headquarters? And the reason why this was so successful, it was really successful. You know, we were able to secure quite a few hires within a few weeks because, you know, because, because the search, so this search was helping people realize their network members, right? Um, I'm always saying that if you guys come to me and say, oh, do you know any great Ukrainian sorcerer? Well, I would say for sure Dima, but then the rest, well, of course I know a lot of people, but you know, I, I don't know everyone by, by name or by heart, right? So people don't know about their network anymore because we just connected people, right? Um, but if you get a link, if you send such a link, you know, that will help your manager or your colleague or your friend or whoever realize their network. And that's a much easier way to say, oh yeah, you know, talk to this guy, talk to that. So that's one. The other, what you can do on LinkedIn actually, is that I recently discovered this one. I think it's, it's always been there. I just forgot to use it, but now with a new search interface, you know, like uh, I just found it again. So you, you can actually search within your connections, connections. Now, some people have blocked it, so it's not working. You can try with Adrian, will not work. You can try with Dima, will not work. But thanks God, you know, when you try with Anna, um, it will still work. Good job, Anna. Uh, so I can, I can tap into, just kidding. I can tap into Anna's network on, on LinkedIn, right? So I can say like, hey, I want to find Ukrainian developers, particularly within this recruiter's network. And, you know, and I leave it to you guys to think about that, you know, how powerful this network scanning can be or what else can be super cool. So when you, you know, when you want to, again, you know, like we are, we are using the assumption that like-minded people tend to connect with like, right? So, so that's, that's the assumption that we build, we are building. So when you go to LinkedIn and then let's say you pick someone from, let's say from a, from a pharmaceutical company in this example, and then you see that that person is quite influential. So I'm using Phantom Buster, and I think I learned it from, from Guillaume again. So I'm using Phantom Buster because via Phantom Buster, I'm able to export every people who has ever liked or commented this post, right? So again, you know, I was looking for an influential person with so many likes. I'm using Phantom Buster, and this is what I get. And I can export all of the people who have liked, you know, like a certain content, and then I can run my search. Like it's a much easier way to search, you know, within this field. Okay, so these were just like some examples, you know, from LinkedIn, how we can tap into to, to those networks. Um, and let's move on. Let's check some other channels. Um, or I may just stop for a second. If you guys have any questions, um, <clears throat> This is how we should build an audience, you know, for matcher. Well, yes, maybe you can. Um, okay, if you guys have any any question, like feel free to to, to put to the chat. Um, if not, then I just like move on and I show you a few more things. Okay, so next one, Twitter. Um, I guess you know, like there are like fewer and fewer recruiters using Twitter, which I personally can understand. But I'm always saying that as long as, you know, as long as our candidates, our potential candidates are using Twitter, I don't care if you like Twitter or not, you've got to use Twitter. I mean, you know, honey, it's that simple. If they are there, you know, if the party is there, you dress up, you know, you make your <laughs> makeup and you and you go party. So, so my favorite tool to search on Twitter is Follow of Wong. Um, so you go to Follow Wonk, it's free. Um, you don't have to, you don't even have to log in. You go there, you know, you start to search, you just put your keywords, you know, you can put the location and then you run it. A few things to, you know, to memorize. One is that remember that people are not building a resume on their Twitter bio, right? So you may not want to add so many keywords in the search bar because that will not work. You know, just like add one keyword, a maximum of two. That's one, two. Um, is that I like to limit the number of maximum followers. Why? Because, you know, because Twitter is, is used a lot by, you know, by companies and by, you know, media channels and whatsoever. And if I want to 
find real people on Twitter. Real people usually have just a few hundred followers. And that's why I, you know, sometimes I, I, I like to limit the number of maximum followers. Okay, so that's high search. Now I'm looking for tax people in, in the Netherlands, in Amsterdam. So I run this search, I get a few, you know, like a few results, you know, 123 results, all sorts of profiles. But what I realized that this guy here, you know, he works at PwC. Um, <clears throat> so I'm just curious, you know, to understand what else can I do with this guy? Now, by the way, <laughs> I hope you appreciate, you know, my, my yellow boxes because of GDPR. I feel like, you know, it's like we talk about sourcing by using, you know, serious condoms. Um, so it's <laughs> so funny. I had to, you know, like I built my slides, let's say X hours, and I had to put all of my yellow boxes because of GDPR. And that was the double time that I had to spend on <laughs> these slides. Anyway, um, save sex. So uh, this is the guy. <clears throat> so let's see what we can do. Well, we can talk to him, but also we can tap into his network on Twitter, right? So I can click on his followers or I can click on the people he follows. And that's already the beginning of the game. So if I click on his followers and I'm using multi highlights, so this is, this is not Andre's tool anymore, unfortunately, um, but this is just like a similar product. It's not as good as the previous multi highlight, um, but you know, it's, it's fine. Um, it works okay. Um, <clears throat> so I'm using multi highlights and I've put text because I want the, the word text to be highlighted on, you know, on, on the screen. And, and because of that, I can easily identify, you know, like one of his colleagues. Okay. So I have two tax managers from PwC from Amsterdam. That's cool, right? Why? Because I can go back to follow a bank and I can try and search within their mutual followership. So my assumption is that if I've got, you know, it's so simple, right? If I have two guys working for the same company in the same position, and if they have mutual followers, I mean, like some of those people should be other PwC tax auditors. It's just like that. So I put these guys' names here and there, and I click on do that. And it will show me, you know, something like this, you know, with Venn diagram. Um, <clears throat> hopefully you like Venn diagrams because you run sourcing and, you know, like we always explain and or not with Venn diagrams. So what you see is that the little, little, little bubble is this guy and the big bubble is the other guy. And the mutual, you know, the mutual part is the mutual connection. And one of the three things, so it's not a big network, right? But one of the three mutual thing is actually a Dutch tax community. And now, because I identify this, this local Dutch tax community, I can run even further the same logic, you know? So I cannot check like, okay, one of the PwC guys and then the tax community, and I try to check their mutual, mutual network. And that's what you see on, you know, on the right-hand side. So it works super simple. And again, remember, we are not using keywords actually with these searches. You know, we build every assumption, like the, 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 the science of our search is based on the assumption that like-minded people, people who have something in common, so their network tend to have the same commonalities that, that they have. Now, we can even move on. You know, I can even go back to this guy. <clears throat> With a giant yellow condom, um, I can click on his list, you know, and then I can I can I can tap into those networks and move on and move on and move on and move on. So while I can understand that you know you don't fancy Twitter anymore, but if your candidates fancy, then I'm so sorry. You have to you have to give it a try. And now let's move on to my favorite part, <clears throat> which is certainly Facebook. And Facebook, you know, with all of those billions of people. I mean, this this is a this is a gold mine, and still it is. You know, Facebook has destroyed your search engine, but who cares? I mean, you know, it's still a great party. It's like a, it feels a little bit like Eastern Europe, guys. You know, it's like it's all ruined, but you still, you know, you still dance and party. So, let's see what we can do on Facebook. Now, first of all, we can actually go to you know people. We can find people. And we can tap into their public friend list. 
So as you can see in this example, you know, if, if someone, as long as you see this number, you see a number, you know, like close to the friends, that means that the public, so that's a public friend list. And sometimes in the public friend list, we have, you know, these filters. So you can click on work, you can click on current city, you can click on, you know, like school or education. And Facebook will apply those filters and will show you, you know, the network members of that particular person. Now, what you need to know is that work applies to every work, like every company that the person has listed on their profile. So it's not only current company, but it's like everything. Okay. And then, you know, I was using multi highlights again. You know, I was looking at truck drivers. That's a big thing in the States, actually. Um, <clears throat> actually, it's, you know, there are three difficult profiles in the States, I guess, per my experience. But Glenn, you can correct me. One is software engineers. Second is nurses. Three, truck drivers. <clears throat> End of story. Now, you can go, you know, you can click on work. You can use multi highlights and look for other truck drivers, you know, who are friends of this guy. Easy. Um, now, I can also use, you can also use instant data scraper, instant data scraper, because instant data scraper like beautifully scrapes LinkedIn, uh, Facebook friends. You don't have to build a recipe. You don't have to pay for it. You know, you, you have to do nothing. Sometimes it's a little bit lost and then you can, you need to click on try another table, but then, you know, instant data scraper will do a, a, a magical job for you. Now, why this is good for me because you know the moment when i identify someone with a few hundred friends or a few thousand friends i click on that one you know i go to the bottom of the page of the friend list i click on instant data scraper i scrape those few hundred few thousand friends and then in a in a google spreadsheet i can super easily you know sort these people now <clears throat> some recruiters you know, like when I when I show these 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 Facebook things, you know, to, to to recruiters, usually people ask this question: like, is it is it really okay to search within someone's friends? I mean, you know, like, so this is not LinkedIn. You know, this is all sort of friends. You know, it's not only colleagues. It's you know whatsoever. Like, like, do we have the right to do that? Like, is it ethical or is it legally correct or is it okay to, you know, even to scrape and export such a data set, right? Um, so that, that's a question that, you know, I, I've usually got and, and I can totally understand. Um, you know what, before I answer, let me ask you guys, um, I go back to the chat. What do you think? Is it, well, let me go to that slide. Is it okay to search within someone's Facebook friends? What do you think? <laughs> okay, <laughs> it is. Well, it's easy. <laughs> Probably I should have asked like, why? <laughs> why? <laughs> why is it okay to search within people's Facebook friends? <laughs> um, <laughs> well, okay, <laughs> you are the best. <laughs> okay, cool. now <laughs> I don't need to explain. <laughs> okay, exactly. So that's the whole point. Well, you know, you search within the friends, but you can only search within the publicly, you know, the publicly available data sets, you know. So it's just so if I if I visited this person's profile, I would be able to see the same information from there, so from the search engine, than you know from the friend list. Okay, so I can totally understand you know those people who say that well you know it's like a little bit weird because you know we 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 actually you know really like tap into those networks and we see so much information, but it's just like public data, you know it's just the same way as you search in any of these channels. Okay, now let's see one more thing that, that I love to run on Facebook. And I guess that's, that's my last last thing you know, for today. Um, and that is this. <clears throat> so Facebook is full with groups, right? And 
you know, some of these groups, you know, are private, so you will never ever get the chance to 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 you know to join them. So what you see on this example is one of my favorite, my masterclass guys. You know, they know it, you know, by heart for now. Um, so so this company, this company has a employee, you know, Facebook group, and and it's private. So I personally will never get a chance to you know to to join this Facebook group because. I've never broke that. Now, the thing is that every Facebook group, every Facebook group has admin members. And that information, regardless the group is private or public, but the admin information is always publicly available. So people who are the admins of a certain group, that data is always out there. Now, what do you think? Please use the chat. Like I love the fact that when you guys talk to me, use the chat. Why seeing the admin member of a group is, is fascinating? What do you think? Use the chat. Like, right, because these are the drivers of the topic. <laughs> Julia, don't say lol, use the chat. Like, please answer nicely. Exactly, they are drivers of the topic. What else? What else? Why, why is it like, you know, so you, you, know, you will never, enter that group exactly because exactly well guess what we talk about human network crackity so yes because admin members <clears throat> you know they they decide on membership right so they decide you know who can log in you know who cannot and and for that reason you know often admin members you know they have a huge network of these group members now we have two ways to move on. One is that, well, you locate the Facebook group. Let's say it's private. You look for that admin member that has a public friend list. And then you can scrape it and then you can, you know, easily sort. And that's what happened here in this example, right? So, you know, we were able to, I think we were able to, to scrape a few hundred of the employees of this company, a few hundred. And again, you know, we didn't use not even a single keyword. We didn't use a keyword, although the scrape result contained so many keywords. And we were able to so easily and so quickly sort and filter and say, okay, fine, these are the quality people, these are the operators, this is the engineering team, whatsoever. But that's only one way. There's one more way. And that's, that's my last tactic, you know, for now. So the last one <clears throat> is this link. Now, this link is a little bit like a legacy link, you know, from the good old days when we were able to search on Facebook. So if you click on this link, um, you will actually see the old Facebook um, user interface. But this link shows you the mutual friends of any two random people. So I can pick any of you two guys, you know, like even without, we are not Facebook friends. And I can check, I can scan your mutual friendships. So let's see how this works. <clears throat> so this is the link. You guys may have got the slides or, or maybe, you know, Susanna, you can just like copy this link. Um, and, then, and then you will, yeah, let me just check the chat. Thank you, thank you. So <clears throat> you are so great and so quick. Um, so you have to replace ID1 with one of the people's Facebook ID number, and you have to replace ID2 with the other person's Facebook ID number. So how to find that number? There were some tools, there are still some tools, you know, that are supposed to show you the Facebook ID, but some of those tools are not really working or really buggy. So per now, today, the easiest way is to go to the page source, and you will see an extremely ugly code, which probably is not ugly, but ugly for my eyes. It's like a mess. And within that mess, you need to use Control F. You need to look for the term user ID, just like this. And you know, once you you know, once you entered that search, you will see that long number. It's usually really long, and then you have to put those two long numbers to you know to ID one and to ID two. Now listen, the the, the exciting part <clears throat> is that, so this, this search, like this link will only work 
as long as at least one of these two people have a public network. Okay, but uh, I repeat myself, even only one of these two people have a public network and the other person has a totally closed network, the search will still show you the mutual network network base. And I think that is super scary. So maybe you have blocked your friend list on Facebook, but one of your friends have not. I will be able to, I can actually construct your friend via this link. So if I use, you know, this link, you know, I'm using the same admin person like this guy and I'm, I, I picked one of her, one of his friends, you know, she works at the same company. I easily, I can easily build an entire organization. And this is a tactic that we've been using for a while. And I can tell you this is like, this is mind blowing, at least for me, because, because the whole concept is that as long as you find two people who have, let's say one thing in common, their mutual network will mirror that commonality. So if I pick two people, you know, who studied at the same school, but let's say they are not, you know, best friends, their network will contain, you know, like other school graduates and other people who attended the same school. If I pick, you know, like two black nurses, you know, who live in the same location, their network, that's what we, we checked many times, their network will, will primarily contain other black nurses from the same location. If I pick two gay guys, I, <laughs> I can tell you right Friday, um, their mutual network will most probably contain other gay guys. It's like, just like, just mind blowing. If you pick two people with the same political opinion, that's how you can build it up. And again, you know, like it is working, even just like one of those two people have a public network and the other one, like, you know, blocked it. It's working. So <clears throat> that's all I wanted to say today. Um, and I guess we have like a, a few minutes, but what is, what is super exciting with this whole 4.0? Is, is two things. One is that when you start this whole experiment, you, at the beginning, you will feel a little bit lonely. You know, you will feel a little bit like, I don't know, like, are we sure, like, if I, if I go back to this list, you know, like, are you sure that these people are colleagues? Because we don't see, you know, it's not written on the profile. There's no such a thing as Java and, you know, but, the more you run these type of searches, the more you will understand that, yes, like at least 85, 90% of the time, they are colleagues and they are colleagues from the same department. So the first, the first, you know, the first feeling, like the first thing, you know, when you experiment this whole thing is like, there's the uncertainty, like you, because, you know, our brain is so much bully and driven, you know, we look for keepers. <laughs> That's how we work. But like behavior searches and even network searches, this is a new concept, like a new dimension of, of the whole search part. And even more so because of the network searches, you will find people who have like no keywords on their profiles and you can still make sure that these are the right people. I can tell you we were, we were using this, you know, this tactic with, 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 a, with a European big four like company. And what was extremely exciting that certainly we were able to put together, you know, to construct the entire department. But beyond that, we were able to find, you know, those top people from the network, you know, who don't work for that big four company, but, you know, who studied together with most of those big four, you know, tax people. They studied at the same Maastricht University. So they are potential people, although they are not even living in that country and not working for that big four, but because we saw that, you know, that that's the same alumni. I mean, you know, we, we can just give them a call and we can try to, to, to relocate them, you know. So this is just like a new mindset. Anyway, um, if you guys want to, this is a <laughs> shameful advertisement. If you guys want to learn with us, uh, we run a new, a new course and we'll talk about these things and even more. Um, so the next sourcing class with us, masterclass, is, is in June. And, you know, you can join the, the fame of all of these other brilliant recruiters and sourcers uh, who have already attended um, the class. So I guess that was it from my end. I'm super curious to see if you have any questions. So I go back to the chat. I thank you so much for your attention.
And let's see <clears throat> if you want to ask anything. If we have anyone still in the call. Um, okay, so can you share a search string template for first degree connections who are more likely to allocate to? Right, so Glenn has a clash. Um, <clears throat> yeah, so Glenn, that was that was a good one. So we didn't, you know, we didn't put any keywords to that link. Um, but you know, but we were using the power, like so we, we build an assumption based on those people who have already relocated to Bantonville, right? And we said, because you have relocated to Bantonville, your network may contain some other people who might be open to relocate. So that was that. Um, Okay, is it not compliance that we scrape? I saw some messages coming while using Power Auto. It. Okay, so Sanjay, um, is it compliant to scrape? Yes, uh, you, you, you can copy paste information manually if you want to, or you can use a scraping engine, and yes, you can scrape information. The question is that what you do with that information and how long you, you store that information, at least from a GDPR um, perspective. But you know, whatever information we scrape, um, <clears throat> that's public data. And the last one, Dima, how to understand on Twitter that our developers write feed only by title, small bio. Um, they may be juniors, write Dima. Um, that's true. But again, you know, when you run what you need, to, yes, you know, like this type of search, yes, there is this uncertainty, you know. I think you know what we need to change is the is our engagement approach. You know, is that we shouldn't say like, you know, I'm sure you're hundred percent best profile, whatsoever, but you can say something like, hey, whoever, you know, like I, I've got you on Twitter and 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 I would love to talk to you because you know we, we may have something for you, right? So we just change, you know, we just change the way we engage with people because we don't know that much as you know, as we used to know before. All right. Um, so in the meantime, many people are waving. So thank you so much for your attention. Adrian, I guess we are good for now. And yeah, and thank you for the invite. Amazing. Thank you so much, Balas. Really, really appreciate it. And, uh, and, and again, as always, next level content, next level content. We, uh, we're gonna we're gonna be looking into some uh, so, so, some networks uh, networks together. I one one last uh, question, Balash. That I was how how do you judge when to start doing this? Because often when, what we try is is also like to kind of like use these kind of technologies, but then you end up spending so much time with irrelevant candidates. Where do you see that this works well, and what other areas are, 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 are not so good? Right. So you know, like. Um, so I have a client, you know, who is who is working a lot on blue color. Yeah. And it's my job to try to convince them to start sourcing. And you know, and they are telling me all the time, well, but you know, we still get the applications. I'm like, yeah, but what is the what is the percentage of the great application, you know, like in your like in your applications? And they say something like, well, it's three percent. I'm like, okay, but well, hey client, but so you are wasting 97% of your time with applications, right? And you still don't want to start sourcing. Now, the, the reason why I'm saying it because you know, yes, you're right. There will be there, there is an uncertainty, you know, like like on Dima's question, you know, judging on someone's Twitter bio, you know, you may be wrong. But hey, when you run a Boolean search, you can be wrong as well. I mean, how many times you know we have to reiterate the search? You know, how many times we have to check profiles, you know, which are not good, you know, like if you just think about how many profiles we actually review on LinkedIn and how many from that, you know, we add to the project, that's already, you know, like that's also uncertainty. You see my point? Yeah. So what we check, for instance, with that Facebook, and we were running numerous like e experiments, is that something like 85% of the, of the mutual friends will be positive to our hypothesis. So if I pick, you know, like two, let's say, big four tax managers, and I start like analyzing their mutual network, the top of that network will be 90, 90%, 85% other tax managers, you know, from, from the same company. So what you need to understand is that there is uncertainty with every search. Yeah, yeah. And there will be false positives with every search. 
it's just like you have to understand the new, you know, it's like a new dimension, you know, how we how we use data. I, I find it fascinating. Yeah, no, 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 it, it is fascinating. It is fascinating. It is definitely fascinating. Palash, thank you so much again. Um, one question in the in the group that was asked at the last moment: Will you share these slides as well? Can we share them with the yeah. audience? Yeah, yeah, we will. Yeah, we will. So it's all fine. Yeah, good. Awesome, amazing, amazing, amazing. Um, guys, once again, Palash, thank you so much. Next week we have Mark Dubel joining, former developer who turns tech recruiter, works for Elastic, a um, very cool tech company, and he's going to uh, tell more about how to reach out as if you are a developer to other developers from a recruitment point of view. Very interesting talk, uh, will also be very valuable content. So I hope to see you there again next week um, and we'll send the recording and the slides as well. Thank you so much, Paolo. Don't forget to join the bus class if you're interested in it. Um, and um, we can share the link as well. Unless if you share the link with us, we'll share it in the email follow up as well. Okay, cool. Cool. And thank you again for joining and for inviting. Have a lovely day. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.